Hey, everybody, this is, I guess, a special episode of Grail Country, and it's uh, not fan fiction, but Laura and I are just kicking it off on the side, and we're going to send it to Nate afterwards. Um, uh, Nate paired us up because our stories apparently are so similar, and I've not met Laura. I've watched a couple of her conversations on Grail Country, and I confess I am starting at the beginning of Grail Country and just watching everything through and just pounding through the episodes just to get caught up with all of the adventures you all have been on. So... Um, Back over to you, Laura. You had said just before we hit the record that uh, our stories are really similar, but we're in different places uh, in some of the journeys that we've been on. And could you just pick that back up again there? And, and I'd love to unpack that and just see where that goes. Yeah. And if I tell you my whole story of my early life as a Catholic, I think you will easily be able to categorize me according to some label you probably already have in your head. So let's see. <laughs> So I converted to Catholicism in college. I had been raised as a Lutheran, um, okay. but I joined the Catholic Church while I was at university. And for one brief shining moment, I was just a Catholic because mm -hmm. the priest who received me into the church was a very, very sort of straight down the straight down the line, middle of the road kind of priest. He was an older priest. He had been ordained before Vatican II. Mm -hmm. But he was very mainstream, very obedient, and also very devout. He was just a really well-grounded person. He wasn't really on a team. He was just doing the stuff he was supposed to do. You know, he didn't get involved in culture war stuff. Mm -hmm. So he was a good person to have you to have bring you into the church. Mm -hmm. But because the Catholic culture war is what it is, if if you enter the church and you're serious about it, you're going to get caught up in it in some way or at least you're going to be aware of it right yeah, just like falling into like black holes of just oh, gravity <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes so part of the problem there is the catholic church is this vast thing right if you come from a protestant denomination mm -hmm. you are used to a certain amount of homogeneity perhaps okay and a certain amount of people only bothering to show up because they really care, I think. Hmm. Okay. Um, because there are a lot of Catholics who are just kind of hanging on, who are in the church. But if those same people had been brought up in a Protestant church, they just wouldn't be going to church anymore. You know what I mean? Right. It's like the habit formation is just, or I don't know what, the expectations are, are different? Well, even know if I want to try to articulate it so quickly. It might take a whole essay to explain okay. why that is, you know? All right. Um, <laughs> but that was, that's something that's a bit different about Catholic culture. And so I think as a Protestant, or as a former Protestant, I had a, a, I had some sense of frustration with the fact that there seemed to be so many people in the Catholic Church who weren't terribly committed or liked the idea of getting away with stuff you know, you know what I mean? Okay. People who were like, well, there are rules, but uh, there are ways to bend the rules. You know, whereas like the people I grew up around weren't trying to bend the rules. Because mm -hmm. again, if you wanted to bend the rules, you weren't in church in the first place. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's so, a different culture. I mean. Yeah. Well, anyhow, keep going. Yeah. So that set me off, I think, on that path that um, a lot of conservative or traditionalist people come to maybe through maybe they have somewhat different stories but the thing that sets them off on that path is a feeling that they want to find the people who are taking this seriously right mm -hmm. um so i think that was that was a big thing for me i was always on the lookout for who are the people who are really taking catholicism seriously Mm -hmm. And um, I moved to different places. I traveled around a lot when I was a young adult. I lived in Germany for a time. And so I experienced the church in different places. And I experienced places where mm, the life of the church is... Um, hmm. I'm trying to think of a non-polemical way to say this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where I'm going? Where, well, where again, you get the feeling that people are not taking it terribly seriously, <laughs> you know? Um, where preaching, where a lot of preaching is, is, is deconstruction, or where a lot of liturgies appear to be some kind of uh, 
appear to be really self-indulgent or or self-celebratory, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that was that was always off-putting to me. So I ran the other way, looking for the people who didn't like that stuff, mm -hmm. and the people who were, you know, going to be keeping it real or whatever you want to say. Yeah. Well, and that's how you end up like reading the New Oxford Review or. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, well, Catholic World Report, uh, I used to read a lot of Catholic World Report, Homiletic and Pastoral Review. Um, I never read The Wanderer, the, is it The Remnant? Is that the other one? Those two, yeah. Yeah, no, I was never, I was never really into those. I did have a subscription to the New Oxford Review for a while, though. Okay. I can, I've not read that one. Oh, and I actually great. never, all yeah. of the ones you just listed, I've never actually read. I knew they were out there. I might have read The Remnant, like... I don't know. I only seen it online, um, but yeah, I missed all of that. Uh, in terms of formation, I didn't get any of uh -huh. that. Yeah, and um, I had friends who were so in college. I had friends who were um, hmm, very into the traditional liturgy in a way that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And they weren't angry. They just thought it was neat, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so they were always talking about like chasubles and thuribles and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Funny things that happen at the Latin Mass when you know the server forgets to lift Father's chasuble up when he's you know all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, all these little jokes you can make based on Latin, funny little things you can just drop into a conversation, right? There's a ton of that. But people were kind of having fun with it. They weren't really, like, angry, right? And I do right. remember we had a book in the college Catholic chaplaincy called Nobility and Analogous Traditional Elites. Oh, okay, you got that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's one. I've never actually read it, but... Um, it was a big deal in part of my family culture. Yeah. And so while I haven't actually read it, I think a lot of what's in it was just part of my growing up. So I couldn't mm -hmm. cite chapter and verse, but I could probably resonate or, or you know articulate maybe some of the ideas and stuff. Yes. You probably absorbed a lot of it by osmosis. And mm -hmm. we would look at that or books that were, it was a TFP book, right? We'd look at books exactly. like that or books that were similar and we'd chuckle over them a bit. There were, you know, occasionally we'd also run across some some book from Tan or something that was about Masonic conspiracies or whatever, and we'd chuckle over that as well. Yum. But we liked them too. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. They were they seemed like fun, even though we weren't taking them super seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a bit of like ha 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 silly book. Eh, they have a point though, you know. <laughs> and then a sort of a quick look afterwards, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um so I so I had that. So I did like I liked the old mass and I used to go to it if I had a chance, right? Mm -hmm. So I lived in northern Illinois when I for a time when I was like just out of college. Uh that's where I was from. And uh originally so like when I went back to my parents' place after college, that's where I was. And so I searched around there and I remember calling some local parish that was just like a normie parish and asking them, where is there a Tridentine Mass around here? And the mm -hmm. secretary just being blown away that I would even ask. So this was like probably 1999, maybe. Okay. And, and, you know, I could hear her talking to the <laughs> priest going, somebody, someone's on the phone asking, asking if there's a Trinitarian Mass. <laughs> Trinitarian <somewhere."> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't on most people's radar at that time. But there was one in Volo, Illinois at St. Peter's. If anyone here is familiar with Illinois, they might remember it. I think it's still going on, actually. But anyway, I used to go to that. And um, so, you know, I'd go to things if I had the chance. But mostly I was going to the Novus Ordo. I never, I never became the kind of trad who wouldn't go to the Novus Ordo or thought the Novus Ordo was invalid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got married and um, the husband had similar, a similar attitude to me. We went to the Ukrainian mass in one town where we lived because mm -hmm. the closest Novus Ordo mass was very lackluster and the most popular Novus Ordo mass in town was rock music. So <laughs> so our, we figured like the, the Ukrainians were the better alternative. So we went there for a while and then, then we moved to this little town where he got a job. Uh, he got a teaching job and mm -hmm. that's the place I've talked to Paul about before. And the reason I talked to him about it was because he had been talking about Moscow, Idaho. And what's that guy's name? Doug Wilson. 
And he, have you heard of him? Now, see, this is out of the so. Catholic loop. I've, I have, I have a more ecumenical uh, viewpoint now because I see a lot of the stuff Paul talks about, or I hear things people, other people talk about. So he's a Calvinist who um, is, I don't know, let's just say, forming a community in Moscow, Idaho. I'll put it neutrally. Okay. Yeah. Um, but Paul was playing some clips of him, and just hearing him just made me remember. This place where I had used to live where there's just this, I think, a sense of overconfidence that you have all the answers and you definitely know just how to live and you're going to get everything right and your kids are going to turn out great and you're going to be so much better off than all those idiot normies who are still living in normal places where everyone's going to hell, you know? So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to get, <laughs> I kind of wanted to get a show and talk about it because, um... And this was your initial conversation with Paul that yes. hasn't been aired? Okay. No, it was aired. It was on YouTube for oh. a couple months, I think. Okay. So like all the people, all the regular Paul viewers probably saw it. Okay. But um, then I put it in. Oh, I asked him to take it off YouTube just because I started to worry that people back in the town I used to live in were going to see it. And I didn't really want mm -hmm. that because I realized that the way I had explained the whole story had mm -hmm. given a lot of people the impression that they, that the people in this town were like really terrible people who were just doing terrible things. And I hated them and they were mean, yeah. which isn't at all what the problem is. So then I realized, mm -hmm. okay, I need to, I need to figure out another way to say what the problem is, but also mm -hmm. I need to make sure that like this version isn't around for them to see because it's going to really upset them. And they were nice to me, you know? Right. So, <laughs> So I, I had the same Paul. issue, like, like, oh, um, yeah. not to interrupt. Well, mm -hmm. yes, to interrupt, but go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> in owning up to uh, what it was and the dynamic that that I grew up in, and then becoming aware of that, and then coming to a point where I just deeply disagree and think it's harmful and dangerous and whatever, but I struggled with how to talk about that in, in any public way, like just as you said, partly because. Um, there were some truly wonderful and beautiful people who were a part of that whole thing, mm -hmm. who I still admire and I think are good people in spite of the context that, you know, that, that they were in. And I think that's probably true of anything. And that's a, probably a big reason why I think it's, it's also prudent in you throwing around the word like cult. It, uh, it immediately connotes a whole bunch of terrible things. But I, when, when you re-articulate that as like, it's just a basic human thing. Everybody does that. Everybody divides ourselves into tribes. Uh, and then you bring religion into it, and that tribe becomes becomes a cult, effectively. So mm. it's, it's something that we, we all default to. And it's something we all have to carefully and attentively disengage from. Because it's just, mm -hmm. it, it's default human behavior. Cult does right. elevate tribal membership to a level of spiritual abuse, though. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where it'll... I think always be problematic. And again, it's like every time you throw something at, you still got to keep clarifying. And I, this is my problem. You keep clarifying into silence because I don't, you don't know what else to say, but there is yeah, a valid yeah. definition of cult. Like one talks about the cult of the Virgin Mary, but it's like, mm. I don't know that we should use that word anymore. It's uh, you have to use it in very rarefied circumstances for it to be appreciated. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, exactly. You make, you make a good point there. And so uh, my interview with Paul is still available as an audio file. If you search oh, okay. the audio records of his podcast on like a podcasting okay. app like Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or whatever, you'll be able to find it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it's called something like Living With Your Father Instead of Rescuing Him from the Underworld. Ooh, <laughs> a very Peterson <laughs> right there. <laughs> well, so one of the things that Peterson, one of the, well, you know, we, we have ways of telling the story of our lives, right? And after listening to Peterson, I came up with a story of my life that was like, I got so attached to traditional things mm -hmm. and the way I imagined things used to be mm -hmm. that my life became a kind of sitting around with your dead father in the underworld and mm -hmm. just being camped out there mm -hmm. rather than the thing you're supposed to do, which is take whatever it is that was valuable in that tradition and carry it forward in a way that that actually works and will still be relevant yeah it's a powerful metaphor or, or visual mm -hmm. yeah on my end like about a year and a half or two years ago i started 
uh, flirting with the idea of owning my own story and seeing if I could share it. And um, I haven't found a metaphor like that, but um, actually it's kind of funny. It's a really good one. It works. Uh, but for me, it was more like, uh, so a little bit of, um, there was one element of my story, which I used to feel was the high point of my life, especially as being a part of this tribe, being a part of this group, um, where I was in living in France at the time, my family had moved there. My dad was a teacher in a school for a bit. And, uh, three of us boys were, were in that school. And I think two, was it two of us or three? I think two were sent up to Austria and there was a retreat being held by this group up in Austria. And, uh, and it was, it was just, I mean, the location is just stunning mm -hmm. and it was an intensive kind of, I mean, uh, it, it was like, there's a formative kind of retreat sort of thing. They were bringing together young people from these different, um, charter houses, whatever from around the world coming together. And, and there's the old guard meeting up with the young blood and, and, uh, trying to reinvigorate things, I guess. Um, and at one point I was invited to represent Australia because that was my home country um, and get up and just address everybody because there really weren't any other Australians or the one who was there for some reason deferred to me. Maybe because I was young, they want to see young people or something. Mm. And I got up and I addressed everybody and all of like the, the heavyweights of this, you know, the, the great council and like whoever were, were there. And I had no idea who half of them were. I was like what, 17 or something. And, and, um, remember saying, you know, echoing back to them, what they had told me, like here, the devil's been unmasked and this is wonderful. And the revolution will fail. And like, whatever. And that used to mark, like I did it, you know, I not only got there, but I addressed everybody. And I'm, you know, like I said, in the other interview, I worked hard to be, um, a good little trooper uh, and to, to be accepted. And one of the biggest points of praise I got from one girl who lived uh, where we lived was um, she said something like, you know, he's, he's a better teen member than any of the people actually enrolled in the official Academy because he takes it more seriously. And again, I really, really wanted it. It gave me a great sense of purpose and whatever. Now walking away from all of that running, manically away from all that and then trying to find new guardrails you know kind of mm -hmm. like that other point that you had made and I was I'm curious to come back to that maybe we'll, we will trying to find new guardrails or new new metaphors new axioms new everything because I can't go back it's like um well yes right. and then realizing that was not the high point that was that was a low point and I've been mm. coming out of that inversion uh, because it was such a confirmation of of ego, of the imagisterium, of the a false church, of uh, you know all of these things that set up and against. Um, obviously, I think we're we're both Catholics, and and I don't think real country necessarily is, but within this spectrum of Christianity, these are not um, as faithful as they uh, uh, make themselves out to be. So for me, that was personally, in terms of like an ego standpoint, that was very much a low point. And since then, um, yeah, trying to figure out what does it mean now to be faithful? And that's why it's so, I enjoy, really am enjoying Grail Country and, and listening yes. to your conversations and David Bentley Hart and, and exposure to um, the Orthodox, you know, sense yes. and, and other Christians and the evangelical and, and just beginning to wonder, well, there, there's a lot, I, a lot I have to learn. Anyhow, back, back over to you. But yeah, it's a oh, great well, metaphor I, you've picked. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, just to finish the summary of my story, we lived in this small town where there was a very intense Catholic community. And it wasn't traditionalist per se, mm -hmm. although most of the people there did appreciate the Latin Mass. And after Samorum Pontificum, we had it occasionally in our parish. And so when it was on, people would go. But people went to the Novus Ordo Mass, too. So that wasn't really the... That wasn't the, the top thing. It wasn't whether <laughs> whether it's the Latin Mass or the Novus Ordo. Um, it was really more like how committed are you to I don't know a certain model of Catholic life, and I think the number one defining element of it was that your children are extremely sheltered because that was why people were there. It was mm -hmm. to keep their children away from bad influences. 
Right. right. I think that was basically the number one driver of most of the stuff that happened there. And so that was also the driver of all the purity spirals. What is it okay to expose children to? Mm-hmm. And nobody ever knows 100% where where the yeah. line is, right? Yeah. But if you don't know where the line is, that's what causes the purity spirals because the most extreme person in town can always say, uh-uh, no, you can't let your kids that- watch that movie because whatever. And then everyone else, if they want to stay in the group, can't let their kids watch that movie, yeah. right? And then, yeah. and then the most extreme people end up dragging everybody else off a cliff. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a bit of a, a divide in the community between methods of child rearing because some people went for a kind of hippie attachment parenting thing and some people were going for like the uh, the how to train up a child book series. Are you, are you familiar with that? I don't know. I, I might be. I don't know. That actually comes out of the Calvinist tradition. It's not a Catholic book series. Okay. Yeah, but people people did read it. Um, and so that was the really strict really old fashioned kind of you want to run a 1920s household that's kind of that book and then and then there were other people doing the more hippie mm-hmm. thing yeah so they got on each other's nerves sometimes <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah um so basically for me and again people weren't mean i think the feeling the feeling i have when i think back to there like if i just imagine myself standing anywhere in town uh, the feeling I have is what I told Paul, which is that there was a spirit hovering over everybody. It's not that any individual people were bad people, in my experience, at least. Nobody was ever particularly mean to me. No one made me feel excluded. You know, no one ever yelled at me about anything. Mm-hmm. But there was just a, there's just a spirit or a dynamic, if you want to put it that way, about the place. Mm-hmm. That almost made you feel physically like something was pushing down on you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Or like you were in a vice, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So after a while, I kind of just snapped. And part of it was due to like health stuff that happened to me. You know, I think always many threads go into these. When people when people lose their religion, there are always a lot of things they can mention that went into it. Yes. But the short, the short story is I just kind of snapped. <laughs> and, then, mm-hmm. and then we left. And then I was like an atheist for eight years um, until I found Jordan Peterson. So that's that basically brings. And then now I'm I'm what I am now, which is I finally kind of got delivered back into the Catholic Church. But having taken this whole journey, I was a different kind of Catholic. And I still want to be a serious kind of Catholic, but I yeah. have a different way of a different way of evaluating. What is what does that mean? Serious, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that's, wow, that's I'm intrigued. Me. Yeah. But then so you can kind of see how I'm at the other end of the story from you right that i was with all these parents mm-hmm. who left who left the fairly average communities they'd grown up in and dedicated themselves to a pretty countercultural way of life that was very strict and where their children's lives were very controlled and the the information that their children had access to was very controlled and their children's experiences were very controlled and who their children interacted with was very controlled. You know? um, that's, my childhood was nothing like that. And I think most yeah. of the other people there, their childhood was nothing like that. So they were raising these, they were giving these children a childhood they had not themselves experienced. Right. So none of us really knew how it was going to turn out. Like turn out. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's a good place for you to for you to pick up well i'm just curious to um like i mean you just described my childhood right there like Uh my parents were both very how do you want to call them normies just uh, my dad was from from brazil um so this is bahia in the 50s i need to do some research on what that even means but he was um not necessarily a devout catholic i think he went to like uh, maybe mass on Sundays. His dad was uh, ra- rabidly anti-Catholic and a Mason and, oh. and spiritism was a big deal. And, and the whole family, I mean, we're talking, I have no idea like how rural all of this was, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of spiritism and stuff like that. So, and then um, my mom was very, from what I can understand, middle-class America and uh, German Irish background. Dad was in the Marines, I think. And they, they, uh, hopped from one edge of the continent to the other, and he did all kinds of different jobs. And um, and then they both found uh, the 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 purity culture of authentic 
um, faithful living in this group, and it painted a quite apocalyptic in the negative sense view of uh, the future of reality of the the reasons for why the present sucks so bad and was uh, Fatima very important? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was poor. The, they, the Blessed Mother was turned into a, a club to just beat everybody <laughs> with. And, and exactly Fatima, <laughs> as much as, you know, we all loved Our Lady, I think that, I think that she was an echo of the Divine Feminine that they had no idea what to do with. It was such a hyper masculine uh, environment and femininity had really had no place. And we don't need to get into, I guess all of that, but Fatima became a harbinger of hell to everything and everything else in that message. Speaking about (laughs) the, the love that heaven has for Mm. people and the joy and the hope and the possibility and, you know, none of that was ever strained through the, the filter of, you know, you know, it, this is one reason why I have a very difficult time with that. How I sh- how do I want to say this? How that doctrine or that dogma is articulated or at least is understood by the common sense, because I don't think it's actually true the way that it's generally understood. Um, and I'm more, much more uh, Bentley Hart universalist kind of thing, mm-hmm. but to see the church warmed by hellfire rather than by heart fire of the mm. sacred heart or something like that. Yes. Uh-huh. It's a completely different, anyhow, that's a whole nother different conversation. Anyhow, so my parents were both very much like that, like what you just described. This had to be the only thing that was going to save the world. And uh, the, the, the level of fear that we're constantly living under, constantly trying to track the signs of the times to know when the Antichrist and three days of darkness were going mm, to come and yes. walking around carrying candles in your pockets. Oh, you know, did you have left candles because they were the only ones that <laughs> always, were going to work during We're the always days prepping yeah, cans yeah. Mm-hmm. in the basement on the side and stuff. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and anyhow, so that was the whole thing. Like, yeah. So our family culture was like, we didn't listen to anything recent. We didn't watch anything recent. Mm-hmm. Um, like the high point was Pavarotti maybe and mm-hmm. uh, classical music culture. Sure. A lot of, I love classical music. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> um, but like we uh, wore suits and ties all day, every day, yeah. uh, all of us. And um, as far as the liturgy though, I liked some of the points you made where um, we were exposed to a variety of liturgies as we traveled around the world, uh, mm. Byzantine, Ruthenian, Ukrainian. And, mm. and part of it was, kind of a release valve to just not have to deal with the questions people would have over at say the Norvis Ordo or something, or if we couldn't find a Tridentine that was, that was available. Um, so that created a, a, a much different sense of exposure to uh, the whole Catholic thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had a sense of how varied it could be. Yeah. And that was always, that was always kind of a big deal that my dad would bring up. And it's funny looking back and, and kind of picking apart how I've been braided together by the different things that he would share and then realizing there's there's so much cognitive dissonance um, in it all. Uh, But so having have had a great, have a great love for the, the, the richness of the Ukrainian right and so on. We were altar boys every Sunday at, at some Tridentine mass somewhere. So the jokes about the, latin culture and all of that and we if we weren't serving we were singing in the choir um mm-hmm. uh, or we were the choir or uh we we're having priests come over and say mass at our place and uh, uh before they came for dinner and something like that so it yeah. was mm-hmm. very very intense kind of liturgical liturgy based lifestyle yes and, and this, uh, there's a certain kind of fun to that i'm sure you remember it i do and yeah. i mean it's partly at the time I didn't know anything else. And I thought, of course, this is normal. And, and there's a lot of beauty to it. One of the things that actually um, started changing my attitude towards that. Uh, So growing up, I would meet people who loved the liturgy, like just really, really loved it. And I never could love it the way as much as they did. And I never understood. I thought there was always something wrong with me. Um, and this is partly because I love novels and movies, mm. and games, and 
media and all of that sort of thing. And I think that's where my heart is. That's where my calling is. And the liturgy plays a different role. It's a different experience. It's a different thing. Stories are in fiction are a different thing. And uh, I could never get it the way that they did. Um, and, uh, and then one day I was actually watching The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And then it was a Sophianic experience just watching it. I think I had just begun to, to understand Michael Martin's work with um, Sophia and the sophiological metaphysics and stuff. And I couldn't understand how that movie had been so hated on growing up. Because the the last Are you few talking moments, about the Disney movie? Yeah, the Disney cartoon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, do I have the keys? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the last moments where, or there's that that song where, what is her name? Esmeralda is singing and she's walking up to the, the church and everybody else is piously praying, God grant me everything I want. And she's like, give, I have enough, grant what everybody else needs. And then she turns around and, and sings out into the world. And um, I, um, then the end of it where what the liturgy is, is transposed into being the festival of human living. And it's mm. the the... The, the glory of what's inside the cathedral is exported back out into human living. And for the first time, I'd never, I mean, I might've read it, but I never understood or experienced it in a way that made sense where everything outside the walls of the cathedral was just as beautiful and needed as what is articulated inside the walls, of the cathedral, and they're supposed to permeate and inform each other. And they do. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, I don't want to paint everybody with a broad brush, which is why I'll always try to qualify what I'm what I'm saying. There are a lot of traditionalists who will anchor in, you know, we do need to save the liturgy. There's a lot of value in the liturgy and there's a lot of beauty. In, and there are those who are meant to be absolutely in love with that. But there's all of this other stuff that we've lost and we don't understand anymore. And, and I think one of the things that really brought it home for me was um, I went on a pilgrimage from... Uh, Notre Dame to Chartres in uh, France. And it was like a three-day pilgrimage. And that was the most difficult thing ever and absolutely incredible. And there was a moment in the middle where mass was being celebrated in the middle of the forest. And it had just rained. There was mud everywhere. And there were thousands of exhausted people trying to grab bread and hot cocoa from the lines of semis just parked, um, ringing the, uh, the resting area. And while mass is being celebrated, all of the, there's tons of French scouts everywhere and they're all holding medieval banners and stuff. And um, as the host is elevated, all of the banners bow, you know, and everybody's bowing and the whole world is bowing. And, and it just felt like, I'm in King Arthur. This is, this is like watching, um, what was that Robin Hood movie that came out in the sixties with Errol Flynn? We mm -hmm. watched that. That's my favorite one growing up over and over. Uh -huh. It felt like slipping back into that world and then walking into Shark. Mm -hmm. And because we were part of a choir, we were privileged to be sitting way up behind the altar and able to then look out at the thousands of people just collapsing in rows before the altar. And then all of the banners came lining up around us. And it was, it was stunning and it was beautiful. And it was uh, a reliving of an ancient form of life. But what was so pertinent for me was the liturgy was the goal. It was, how do I even say this? It's like it was the the thing that animated your life, but it was not your whole life. And I'm probably saying this wrong, but um, it was something you did as a pattern with something like Peterson would say. It was like a pattern that you would communally come and pay an incredible amount of attention and reverence and devotion to, and it was true. But then you would go back and enact that pattern out in the world. And that was never clear to me in a in any appropriate way growing up. It mm -hmm. always terrified me the most out of any mass was when father would say, and now go forth and preach the word. And I would be flat out terrified because I had no idea what that meant or what to do. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm the son of an apologist. You know, he makes his living defending everything, and fighting everybody. And, and I'm scared in my boots to open my mouth about anything because, and I don't even know why. And that's actually what started really prompting Um some of my own research and my own journey was getting up into a bus in Australia. I was working for a company that did apologetics and Catholic distribution of materials and stuff. And I got up into a, a bus and a couple of people were chatting about 
the the church that we were just driving away from. Um, and they were making some jokes about the faith. There were, some of them were asking just some questions about what Catholicism was. And I could not turn around and say anything because I was so afraid of, I don't even know what, I was afraid of being judged. I was afraid of being seen as silly. I was afraid of uh, a lot of things. Sure. And I don't know, maybe it's probably in the great scheme of things, good that I didn't turn around because it's what prodded me. It, it, it was the thorn in my side for years after. I was like, you, know, you not you weren't good enough, but you need, you're doing something wrong. And mm -hmm. there shouldn't be, I, don't know, I love that line from Daredevil, Father, why do I feel so guilty? Well, it's because you're not finished yet. You know, there's something still left to be done or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just been a lot of, deconstructing for the first five years out of this past decade and then a lot of reconstructing and uh -huh. discovering a new kind of Catholicism mm -hmm. and I'm really curious kind of where you're going because for me Tom Burke and, and mm -hmm. discovering Steiner and Hart and mm -hmm. all of these people are now creating a new outlook that's so different but yeah. at the same time so faithful that yes. I don't really know what to do with you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so did you ever get deconstructed enough to not believe in God at all? No, I didn't. I Lucky. Didn't. <laughs> I remember there was one point, one very, very clear point where I almost walked away. And it was um, my second girlfriend had uh, broken up with me over the phone. And then the phone died. And I grabbed the other phone and then that one died. And so I was feeling very traumatized and whatever. And, and I ran upstairs to uh, try and pray before the the picture of the Sacred Heart and, and ask for, I don't know, guidance or something. And I remember very clearly in that moment, it was like a mental image of horns sprouting from his head. And it was an opportunity to fear and reject him. It's like, this is what happens when you follow him or something. Mm. And that would have been a moment, I think, when I could have very clearly walked away from everything. Um, I was w I was a needy so-and-so at the time. And so something like a girlfriend was way too big a deal. Um, mm. But I ended up in that moment choosing not to and just shutting my eyes and doubling down. I'm going to choose to trust and I don't know where this goes and so on. Mm. So that was the... So I've never really uh, had that struggle. Well, that's good, um, I guess. I think... I think the reason, I suppose that the reason I went through what I went through is that there was always some amount of fear in the faith that I had. Mm -hmm. Not fear of going to hell, but fear that it wasn't true. Yeah. Right? I was always clinging to it and being afraid that it might not be true. Mm -hmm. And so I had to face my biggest fear in the end, you know? I had mm. to go through years of living as if it was not true and assuming it wasn't. Mm. And then being like, well, what do I do now? Because that was what my whole life was based on. And it was really the only thing I cared about, you know, or it was the right. top of the hierarchy of things I cared about. Mm -hmm. And it was the thing that made me care about other things, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so then I had to go through that that well i guess you could call it a dark night of the soul although i don't feel like i can claim that because dark night of the soul is what happens to you when you're persevering in the faith you know what i mean i don't know <laughs> but you if don't that's actually lose your believe in god do you what do you think i mean it, i think it can happen at different stages but i think that how do i want to say this as a here's where i'm looking for opportunities to talk about the stuff rattling around in my brain. <clears throat> I think that our definitions of a lot of things are so much more narrow than they need be. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the label Catholic is something that you apply to a specific stage or experience of uh, living a set of conditions or living a set of clearly defined checklists or something, mm -hmm. you know, where I, I obviously see or feel myself to be as a, a, a dues paying member or a dynamic and, and in love member of a particular tribe. I don't see that as what Catholic is, what's ever really meant to mean. It was meant to mean the totality of your existence and your 
whatever you're going through, it's all Catholic anyway. And that's where I've loved like what that. Tomberg does. You know? Yeah. So, so I've read a little the, bit of Tomberg because Nate sent me the book. Okay. And I've only read it once and I had no idea what I was reading and I'm slowly yeah. chipping through it again. <laughs> I haven't read the whole book, but what I've read of it, I really liked. What I, I liked loved about it was, exactly. What I loved about it was the sense of everything that you have been given as definitions are just too narrow. Yeah. They're too, they're either too materialist or they're too pragmatic or they're mm -hmm. too constrained in terms of time. They don't embrace the the universality of God present in everything and acting through everything. Since, as an aside, and well, not as part of all this, since cultivating this sense of what it means to be Catholic, as in the not just the biggest, widest, most possible and generous sense. It's like, no, it's just the everything sense of everything um, and every stage of human living. I think you then go back to sacred scripture and all of a sudden, all of these other elements started jumping out at me, which is, yes, God called the chosen people, but then look at how many times he's sent missions out to everybody else, like Nineveh, who were terrible people, or... Sodom and Gomorrah, they had a chance. Or I can't even imagine all the others. And you start learning stuff like the different, um, like what is it, the, the axial age that we're in now? Like it blew my mind when I looked at the dates and they all meshed up for Moses, yeah. Buddha, uh, darn it, somebody in India, and I've forgotten, maybe Confucius, I think it was. They're all within like 100 years of each other and they're all preaching a very similar message mm -hmm. that's different, it's distinct. Mm -hmm. But it's all rooted in this in, in a same deeper view of reality. And they're yes. all beautiful. Yeah. Like Pythagoras that, is another one right yeah, at the same time. Yes. That's definitely an interesting thing to explore. And it's the kind of thing that scares Catholics of a certain sort, perhaps, right? That's the kind of exploration that's scary because oh no, are you gonna discover that the Catholic Church actually isn't the one true <laughs> faith and and there's more going on? Oh, and no. that's where, <laughs> and that's where I would want to like drive a Titanic into those those words because my parents would keep asking us, "Why are you Catholic? What's the answer?" I don't, I don't know. It's okay. It's the one <laughs> true Catholic and apostolic, and that's it. You know, we yeah. live and die by this. Like, oh, but it's it's so weird to use those as as your guardrails to differentiate and and, and push everybody else away. As yeah, opposed to all of these are the Ariadne is, threads that you pull on on every culture. Yes, right. All of human history is interesting and relevant and worth exploring and has some wisdom for you, for sure. Well, yeah. All of it is. Like, I love yeah. that. The If it's true, it's true no matter where it's from and who says yeah. it. I think it's mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas who's like, you know, the Holy Spirit yeah. blows where it wills. And yeah. every culture um, has not just a wisdom tradition because wisdom is capital W it's a, it's a single truth and it may be captured or articulated, mm. um, however brokenly. Um, but that, that's a whole different discussion, mm -hmm. but I, coming back to the, your, your point about the dark night of the soul, I think that, uh, there are plenty of people who go through it and when they do learn from it, what happens is a much greater sense of groundedness, or contact with reality. Mm -hmm. And even if that is not obvious to them that it, it's matching up with these specific labels that a specific culture in Christianity uh, from the last 400 years has identified, you need to be living these experiences to be, you know, in. Um, I don't think that that's anyhow necessarily accurate. Um, I think it's, I think it's much more expensive than that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and that's kind of where my heart is now, too, being more expansive and um, more curious and more at peace because I went through my thing that I was afraid of. Now I don't have to be afraid of it anymore. I forget if you've actually shared that. Could you share what that thing was you were afraid of? That oh, it was, it was just that I was real? always afraid God didn't exist, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I just ended up having to live as if he didn't just because mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever happened to my mind. And uh, so, so I, I got through it, you know, I faced my biggest fear 
Mm-hmm. And then uh, there was about a week in the fall of 2020 where I kept seeing things like Bible verses tacked to walls in places that weren't my house or um, or people would say things to me or something would pop up online or whatever. Like I, I saw a series of uh, just a series of things that made me feel like God was saying to me, okay, you can come back now. You know, kind of like you learned your lesson. Come mm-hmm. on back in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what are some of the um, questions then that you're, are you still grappling with any or do you found, are you in a place of uh, rest or? I think are there are a still... lot of things that don't worry about. Hmm. Um, I think Jonathan Peugeot kind of helped me to be chill about certain things. Okay. Um, because he has this way of saying, well, you know, he's got a very, what would you say? He seems very at peace, right? And things that people yeah. are worried about that might happen in the future, his take on it, his take on it will always be something like, the pattern has to play itself out. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I feel like I did come back to something that's real and something mm-hmm. that's really grounded in reality and the, that God really is the ground of being and that God is really moving and... Uh, and so I don't have to be afraid. Things will unfold as they're meant to unfold. And I don't have to understand everything either. And if I could understand everything, it would probably be mm-hmm. made up because, um, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, it was, the... I wrote an article a little while back called, I lost my apocalypse. Now what? And the idea was, um, and he used a picture of Stranger Things, you know, with the kids <laughs> staring at the big storm clouds, because that was that was our lives. Like I said, we were we were mm-hmm. counting down the days till the apocalypse was gonna, you know, uh, fire off. And, and of course, I was sure I was going to survive because, I mean, of course. Uh, but then it was going to be scary, right? It was almost <laughs> maybe worse to survive. Uh, I don't know. See, the other side was supposed to be wonderful and amazing. Yeah. Once yeah. you got through it. Yeah. Um. It was it was a thing. Anyhow, so losing that. Um, there would there would be these points or these hints along the way where I was really beginning to struggle. Like we talked about purity culture briefly for a, you know a second, and I remember we were watching like um, uh, Pride and Prejudice from like the was it the eighties or the nineties? Ooh, the yeah. one from the nineties with uh, Jennifer Ayla and yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the guy Colin Firth. Colin Firth. Yeah. Yep, I've got it well, on DVD. It's still, the, it's still the best. Yeah. Sorry, everybody, but it's <laughs> no, definitely um, the best. Yeah. And there's one point where my little brother, who was like, it was six or seven or something, and all of a sudden he's, we were watching it together, and then he's running up to the screen and he's holding up pillows to to cover the bosoms. Oh. And we're like, wait, hold on, we've done something wrong. This is too much. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. What? What do you say? How do you yes. walk it back? And uh, uh, and so that was like that was one little little thing. I was like, hmm. I think after watching your your latest video, I left a comment where the sense of building a culture around the sense of no means you're yeah. never going to stop shaving away and peeling yes. away an out damned spot forever, right? As opposed to a culture that's that's founded on a yes. Yes, exactly. It's a yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, different orientation. Right, but um. Darn, I forgot where I was going to go. But well, you mentioned the apocalypse. I want to ask you if you've ever read this book. Do you I recognize it? wanted. I've read the uh, the preview for it in Kindle. Ah, I got so, so triggered rereading. Oh, that. you get really I'd triggered. forgotten yeah. all of all of that. And she's like, <laughs> "This is my childhood. Like everything." Uh huh. Um. Yeah, oh my was... gosh, I read that book three times. See, that wasn't my childhood, so I was. I didn't have any trauma associated with that. <laughs> But I was familiar enough with it that I was like, yeah, yeah this is the thing. You know, I, I loved it. It's so yeah. well written and it's, uh, oh, it's so detailed. Yeah. So if anybody out there wants to understand the kind of thing we're talking about, that's, waiting for that's the apocalypse. A good, I don't know where Veronica the rest of the book goes, but I'm sure it's all it's all right there. But that's the thing is yeah. is losing that apocalypse. Once you take away the impending, you know, um, Mount Doom, 
and the sense of we're on a highway to hell and everything is a ticking time bomb. Yes. Once you take that away, what are you left with? And that's actually, I think that is, um, well, that's the kind of thing I'm going to be wrestling or, or resting in, not just wrestling with for the rest of my life, because how you think about the church and the church's story and where it goes from here and what part we play, it's all so different because it's not based on on fear. And yes, the more that, um, the things that I was always afraid of were things like legal fictions in the faith. Um, and I wanted things to be real. I always knew that it was real, but under what sense or in what way? And I couldn't stand it when people would use the words in a sense or <laughs> under a mode of aspect or like whatever. It's like, eh. you know, I'm not yeah. smart enough for that. What, you know, um, oh, I've forgotten again where I was going, but. That's that reminds me of how Peterson, how often Peterson says, it's something like, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I so enjoyed. And uh, Peterson's another one. Learning, uh, dipping into everything that I was never given as a kid, like uh, Carl Jung and, uh -huh. and people like Peterson. And, uh, well, Pajot has been another thing. The last five years for me have been a roller coaster off into the deep end, trying to understand all the stuff that... Um, just broadening how I think about the, the the church and how she relates to everything. And now I've got this growing, growing sense that the Catholic co the, uh, contribution to the Christic mystery is, it's still paramount, but it's not as, um, how do I want to say this? It's not as broad and all encompassing as we, uh, keep keep wanting it to be we keep wanting it to be here's the tribe that i join as opposed to here is the ferment or the enzyme as, as like tomberg will put it that you take in and live out where you are when you are and with whom you're with mm -hmm. that's a very very different um way of uh of approaching uh everything so yeah. The the Catholic thing that that um, is is brought to the world is that sense of of maybe the, the the hierarchy, the sacraments, and papal continuity, that sort of thing. Everything else, well, obviously there's the attendant dogmas and stuff, but everything else is parsed by and is revisited and renewed by where we are and what we know and who we are, mm -hmm. and it's. I don't know. It's a, uh, I'm still trying to find a way to, to articulate that, but um, yeah, there are things I'm also grappling towards articulating and I don't usually do a good job, but we're getting somewhere, I think. So there you go. Um, a yeah. little bit of a different, different journey, but I feel like we're uh, coming to resonance uh, or sort of tracking along the same, same paths. Uh, I love the phrase, the sacred pilgrimage of life. And like, we're, mm -hmm. we've, we've met up and we're kind of walking together and it's, it's cool, different beginning places. And, well, um, I, can, I can tell you something I told my husband, this was my attempt to articulate something and maybe I, maybe I got it right, but you tell me. So up until a few months before I went back to the church, I was still saying, Oh, I'll never be Catholic again. And then I decided I would be. And some people who knew me were a little worried about me becoming Catholic again. Okay. And I said, don't worry. This time around, I'm going to be a peasant Catholic. <laughs> Basically, and, and the way I summarized this, if they asked, was something like, you know, worship Jesus. The saints are your friends. Love your neighbor. <laughs> you know, don't worry about the dogmas because that's someone else's job. Mm -hmm. Other people's sins are not your business, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah, that's that sounds very similar. Um, in following Michael Martin and how he likes to articulate, I'm a bit of a what does he say? Like I'm a pagan anarchist Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> the more I walk that, I'm like, you know, that makes just too much sense not to. <laughs> and this is something I find I've been doing. Um, 
Oh, I grew up so uh, not just growing up incredibly straight laced and stuff, but that's just part of my personality is to also uh, do that and be that and to let all of that scrupulosity go, let all of the, the a lot of the mental habits go um, to allow things like being married to kind of break down everything that I think is important and to come to terms with what actually is important. Um, I'm so much more now in love with uh, one, this pagan sense of engagement with the enchanted reality that always was. And I didn't know it, uh, but it was always there. A mm -hmm. um, little bit of that anarchist, which is probably the rebel in me. Um, but it's just a deciding where to apply that anarchy. And that's, that's kind of the thing. In my case, one being separated from family and then also navigating just to, just questions about how do we want to interact with each other, uh, with the, the neighborhood, with local culture, with uh, our, our tribe in the church, you know, that we're in or the area of the church that we're in or the politics and the time where we are. And, and so much of that, I begin to realize it's, it's not good or healthy for me to be up in that. So find a couple of people that I trust and focus more on in my case, I just want to find out and understand what is the healthiest and the most uh, real way that I can come to meet Christ here and now, uh, spe specifically in my family, um, in myself, and then turn that into things that I can talk about to give to my little one. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think th those are, are my marching orders, is finding that stability. Um, and the, the scrupulosity always wants to like, warm back in oh you're not doing it right you're not thinking the right thing you're not following the right people oh look this person tweeted this thing and so i just i have to stay off twitter <laughs> uh, i desperately keep reinstalling and uninstalling all of my social media apps and they always come back because it's also part of my job it's like dang it they're all back in I'm trying to find a way to give myself the freedom to be creative because this is that thing for me yes. um is the creativity the novels that's one of the reasons why i've started a whole community around this is I want to create a community and a culture that I'm not finding anywhere else um, mm. that's anchored in the fun of story, but using it as a mystical path to draw us or to pull us or to catalyze us into uh, a more authentic faith life. So it's a chance for me to kind of geek out about stuff that I'm learning and reading and stuff, but um, a chance to meet people, but most importantly, a chance to start thinking uh, like what Grail Country is doing. Mm -hmm. How are we looking for the grail? And I think that is a bit different to how are we receiving communion? And that's why I love this metaphor of maybe you can't bring your father back up from the underworld. Maybe he's not ready to come up or maybe that's where he's staying. Or maybe for him, it's not. For you, it is. And you just need to walk away from that and find mm -hmm. a new father. Because uh, there's a point where it's, you, you've got your biological father. But then there's also the father of your culture. And this right. is something Tomberg has a big deal about. He's like, honor your father and mother is not just your biological parents. Mm -hmm. It's the father that is the country that that orients and organizes you. And then your mother is the world and the womb that mm. keeps you nourished and in physical life. You know, so right. If it's, yes. Yeah, so if your father that's in the underworld is your culture, which is more what I was thinking, mm, okay. then what you need to do with it is figure out what of it can be brought into the present. And that's how you save yeah. your father from the underworld. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to find the grail, you have to ask a question. What's what? Are, what question are you asking? It's an interesting question. Um, what, maybe, maybe I already, I don't know, did I, is it possible that I already found it so that I got to think of a question that I already asked? For me, it, um, it's been a very long time since reading, uh, Grail Quest literature. And it's actually a reason why I'm excited to be plowing through Nate's stuff on Grail Country is to kind of bone up on that. Like what is the Grail Quest and so on. And I have vague memories from, from Tom Burke. I have a vague sense of what it is, but I'm curious you're a little more uh, clued into it than I am. Oh, well, you know, I, my view of the grail is maybe a little different from the average because my, uh, my only serious detailed 
contact with our theory and literature has been in German. Mm-hmm. So I read Wolfram von Eschenbach and in the same class where we covered him, we also had to read Chrétien de Troyes just to know what had preceded him. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's like my main, my main source for the Grail story. So even when I picture the Grail, I don't picture a cup, mm-hmm. which is different from most people. Um, it's a mystery what it even is. You know, it's some kind of a it's some kind of a stone Mm. and a dove flies down from heaven every good Friday and touches it with a host. Right. And that's what enables it to be a cornucopia for the coming year. Does this all ring a bell Uh, with you or is this new? It's been such a long time. Those sound familiar. I have not, I don't remember the mystical, like, uh, Um, yeah. And you have to be, you have to have a certain kind of purity of heart to serve it. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Who was I listening to really that was talking about how Parsifal, maybe it was Marsh something. I don't know. He was talking about the Grail Quest and Parsifal or something. But um, I think it was with Nate actually, but he was talking about how Galahad was like <laughs> not meant to be the the emulatable one, but um, it's Galahad Parcival is the lady. Is. Sorry, you mean Gawain? No, not Gawain, Galahad. Oh, okay. Galahad was always the, the purest knight who sat. Oh, on right. The, yeah, yeah. The, the pure right. seat. Sorry, Gawain is 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 the foil in Wolfram's Wolf Parsifal. Okay. You know, he's the guy that like the alternate chapters are about. Uh, and he, uh, I said Gawain, right? He uh, mm-hmm. he's the ladies' man, so he's right. off having adventures with. So the wrong lady, basically. And then yeah. I think Galahad. Oh, yeah. uh-huh. Galahad might be good, or I'm sure Galahad is meant to be a good person, but I think he's like the inverse Gawain, or if Gawain oh, is the inverse yeah. Galahad, yeah. he's uh-huh. so completely detached from all women in this. And the sacred feminine in everywhere, but except for the, uh, the purest form. And then you got Parsifal, who's the balance between them, who get, who's broken by and then broken into by the sacred feminine. And is, the, I would imagine, the one who's most resonant with what the Grail is uh, able to teach. Yeah. Now, did people in your circles would you up like Wagner at all? <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. I think half of them oh, were terrified of him, not. and the other half oh, really? loved him. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, are, are you at all familiar with, with Wagner's Parsifal? Uh, no, probably not. No, that, I mean, that's, in that's a little bit, but not much. <laughs> stay, stay away from Wagner's Parsifal. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> I never really read read much Wagner. Um, so, what were your know. what what novels were important to you when you were growing up? Hmm. Uh, Narnia was a show in Nar- that was the first I think that I ever read. Um, we were never allowed to read Lord of the Rings for a very long time. Um, my dad was convinced it was like satanic for a very long time. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, mostly because he stopped reading once Gandalf met the Balrog and he was like, that's it. Because of his spiritist background uh, and his family, he was hypersensitive, I think, to a lot of that stuff or maybe traumatized by it. And so he couldn't get into it. So, uh, Lord of the Rings was never a thing. Um, so it was Narnia. Uh, Chronicles of of Prydain by Stephen Alexander. Oh, sure, yeah. Or, sorry, no, Stephen Lawhead. Like, no, is that like Lloyd the, Alexander? The black, the black Cauldron. Black Cauldron. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> growing up in Australia, um, very British um, a- Anglophone uh, diet. So, um, Stephen Lawhead was another one. I think he's also a Christian and maybe sort of a Welsh Christian. Um, he wrote the Dragon King saga and a couple of others. Um, Lord of the Rings came later when I was about 16 or 17. And then that was uh, a pretty, that was amazing. Other than that, it was just a ton of mythology um, from oh. all different cultures around huh. the world, Indian, Hindu, hmm. um, Japanese, uh, Chinese, Norse, African, just everything. I love reading everything. I was a total book nerd. Um, maybe once a month, or once a week. And we'd not only go to the library, my mom would take us to like, um, secondhand store and she would go get clothes and I would go get books. And so I had like a a whole library in the garage, just like stacks and stacks of stuff, but a lot of fantasy. Uh, And then I learned, discovered sci-fi and Arthur C. Clarke and stuff like that. And that really started uh, also planting seeds and challenging and wondering about this sort of thing. So, Hmm. so it's like, sorry, I I give you a disappointing non-response when you ask me what, what's my question, but Hmm. that is an interesting thing to ask with regard to finding the grail it did remind me that the 
there was a question I asked that precipitated my fall out of the Catholic Church, and that was, why are we doing this to ourselves? Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was probably a significant question in my past. That's a question maybe some people never get up the courage to ask if they're ruining their lives, you know, doing something. That's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. think I have not formulated a question until this moment. And I think the one that would really hit, that does hit home, is the question, is this it? Hmm. Because for me, fear fear of death was just, it was a big animating deal um, mm -hmm. growing up and for my family. Not for me, because I didn't really care too much. Life was too much fun. But now it's getting older. Uh, it's now hitting home a lot more. And so many what feels like so many missed opportunities and i think we need to start wrapping up here but what sometimes feels like missed opportunities or just things happening or resentment or whatever and then the question then is is this it and is there what else what else is there and this is i think been a big driving thing for me i don't know if this is my grail question hmm. um but it is certainly a big one and it's Maybe it's also my personality type. I'm a type five. I just, I'm a black hole for research and stuff. You mean five on the Enneagram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the Enneagram. I'm a one. Oh, okay. Well, that's, there you go. That's why we jive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, or I flatter myself, that I have strong wings. And that's what keeps me being hyperproductive. I then tend into weaponized ADHD. So that's a different problem. But Interesting. Um. This yeah, is as one for a question, I, I know what you well, I kind of know what you mean by is this it? That mm -hmm. was a question that hit me in my 30s, like mid 30s, I guess, along with the question, why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> because because I think the problem was um hmm, I don't know. To be to be a highly religious Catholic in the most conventional sense, you you deny yourself an awful lot, you know, of experience. Yeah. And if one day you allow yourself to think, is it possible that I'm going to die and there's nothing on the other side? And this was actually my whole life. And this was the only conscious experience I'm ever going to have is whatever happens until I die. Mm -hmm. Is it really worth it to be living the way I'm living? You know? Yeah. I think, um, I, I'm vibing right with that. I th I don't know if it was Peterson or if it was Bentley Hart who said something like, it's probably Peterson actually, who's like, um, you don't actually live according to what you believe. Um, you say all these incredibly important things, but then you go and you live your life a different way, which means what you actually believe is what you're actually living. So take a good hard look at that and mm. get around that, understand that. And it may just be that everything that you say is true isn't actually, because you can't actually live that. Hmm. What can you actually live is what you're actually doing. And that's what you actually think is real and it's what, it's what you do. Mm -hmm. And so, again, partly living under this apocalyptic sort of thing and then walking away from it in scrupulosity, sort of getting a hold, and like, what are you doing? You're damning yourself forever. And it's like, well, what do I actually believe? Because how am I actually living? And, oh, well, there's a whole other discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, we could probably talk for another hour, but you wanted to wrap it up, right? <laughs> well, we prob probably should. I've, I've got to go put my little girl down and we oh, yeah, usually yeah. do story time and make too, cocoa. So. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, th Laura, this was, this was awesome. I've yet to meet, um, I think, a, a Catholic, one that I can chat with. I mean, they're out there. I've yet to actually chat with somebody who's been on a similar journey and who gets these things. And I think there are probably more people that are quietly watching the channel who might uh, really enjoy this. And if they do, I don't know, I'm going to pull a Nate here and, and you know, um, ask, you know, drop your questions maybe in the comments and maybe we'll come back and just keep chatting about them. And who knows, sure. maybe this becomes another series of conversations or something, or either way, I'd love to keep chatting and uh, yeah. just kind of walking around these things. I have no idea of half the stuff that I, you know, I'm thinking is good or accurate or helpful. And, but for me, it helps to just simply just talk about them with somebody else and, and hear how somebody else is walking around them too.
Yes, and you're the first person I've bumped into in this little corner of the internet who has such a similar experience to mine. So, yeah, you and I can be a little team from now on, maybe. <laughs> I'd love that. That would be great. <laughs> okay. And everybody who's in the comments who enjoys that, thanks for thanks for watching. Thanks, Nate, for allowing us to have this conversation. We'll see where it goes. But this has been so much fun. And uh, yeah, welcome to Grail Country, everybody. <laughs>